Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this session, uh, we have a number of people here to talk about Mars surface systems. Uh, we're going to need a number of different kinds of capabilities uh, on the surface of Mars when we have uh, humans there, uh, including things like habitation, like power, uh, communications, mobility, uh, EVA suits. So we won't be covering everything that we need there, but we have uh, covered some of the, we'll cover some of the high points here today. Uh, I have four people here who are joining me and uh, they will be covering, um, Robert Howard will be covering uh, habitation, Natalie Mara will be talking about EVA, Pat McClure will talk about power, and Paul Wooster uh, is making a second appearance today and will be talking about some of the architectures and uh, in space transportation that uh, SpaceX is working on. So what I'd like to do in this session is uh, I'll start off by introducing or giving you a little bit of background about each one of our speakers. Uh, we'll give them uh, each about 10 minutes time to go through uh, a short description or discussion session of, or description actually of uh, their particular capability where they specialize. Uh, as soon as we get through with each one of the presentations, uh, we'll open up the session here for questions and answers from, uh, from the audience. So please hold your uh, questions until that time, and then we have two microphones set up here in the room to, uh, to handle the questions from, from the audience. So uh, first, uh, to my left here is uh, Dr. Robert Howard. He has a bachelor's in science degree uh, in general science from Morehouse College, a bachelor's of aerospace engineering from uh, Georgia Tech, he holds a Master's of Science in Industrial Engineering with a focus on uh, human factors from North Carolina A&T State University and a PhD in Aerospace Engineering with a focus on spacecraft engineering from the University of Tennessee Space Institute. Uh, currently, Robert is the lab manager at uh, JSC's uh, Habitability Design Center. He uh, leads a team of architects, industrial designers, engineers, and usability experts um, to develop and evaluate concepts for spacecraft cabins and cockpit configurations. Uh, Natalie Mary is uh, an experienced, I'm sorry, let me start over. Natalie, <coughs> pardon me, has received her bachelor's degree from, in aerospace engineering from Texas A&M, and she's an NCOSI certified system engineering professional. Uh, she spent a number of years as a, a flight controller supporting uh, the International Space Station at Mission Control in Houston. Uh, she's now a lead systems engineer uh, in exploration, integration, and science directorate, where she works with uh, the EVA Systems Office developing uh, for the development of the Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or XEMU. Pat McClure has a bachelor's uh, from the University of uh, Oklahoma and a master's from the University of New Mexico. He's currently the lead project, uh, currently leads the project of the, for the killer power at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, he helped define the, the groundbreaking approach that was used for that reactor development and they just recently completed a, a ground test of this at uh, uh, the Nevada test site. Um, and he was a regulatory lead for that project. Uh, Pat's a former line manager for uh, nuclear systems design and analysis group at uh, Los Alamos, where he spent uh, 24 years performing nuclear design for very small reactor systems and safety analysis for those reactors. Uh, and finally, uh, Paul Worcester uh, received a bachelor's and master's degree in aerospace engineering from MIT. Uh, he joined SpaceX in 2007. Uh, he worked on a number of aerospace projects prior to that, but uh, in, he joined SpaceX in 2007. Uh, he's the principal Mars development engineer uh, at SpaceX, where he uh, is the lead in technical development for Mars architectures and vehicles. Uh, this includes precursor activities and human scale, human scale systems to support those Mars missions. He previously served as space, uh, SpaceX's Manager of Spacecraft Guidance, Navigation, and Control, overseeing the integration of systems design, fault tolerance, and vehicle performance associated with the Dragon missions that uh, support the International Space Station. Uh, he currently serves on the National Academy's Space Science Board. So that's our panel for today. 
Uh, we'll start with uh, Robert and uh, let him talk about his uh, background in habitation systems, and then we'll proceed with uh, the rest of the uh, members of our panel. Robert? Good afternoon. Okay, well, let's just go ahead and get, jump into surface habitation. And I'm gonna speak generally. A lot of what I'm saying is applicable specifically to Mars, but for those of you who are interested in the moon, if you're looking at long duration surface days, a lot of this will also apply. And a lot of times when people think about habitation, they wanna jump immediately to whatever they're calling the habitat module. I do wanna point out that you need to think about more than just what's inside the pressure shell, if, because your astronauts are gonna interact with the external environment both through EVAs as well as through impacts of the external environment on the pressure shell itself. So just think about their entire neighborhood, so to speak. When you think about how you live, you've got your house, but you don't just stay inside your house. So just similarly, the crew on Mars is gonna have a region that they live in, not just the habitat. You wanna think about the implications for both the crew systems as well as your robotic systems. So that's important when you think about the walking paths just metaphorically with this, with this auditorium, it's designed for people, so it's great. But if you wanted to bring a pickup truck in here, you'd have a problem. So similar thought for your habitats. A lot of the habs are gonna have mobile units, logistics modules that will connect and disconnect. You may have small robotic walkers, you may have robotic ro rollers. All of that needs to be considered in terms of how the humans are gonna interact with that total system. Windows, I think in some of the earlier presentations, you've heard people talk about the crew wants windows. And it's a definite the crew wants windows. But you need to think about how is your outpost gonna be set up so that you look at what are the windows facing. If there's sunlight coming in, you need to think about how does that affect your habitat's thermal control system. If you're using terrain for radiation shelter, did you give the crew a view of the terrain or did you give them a view of a bunch of regolith that you piled outside of it? So you also wanna look for, as I mentioned with radiation shelter, how can you use that to help assist with the hab? On the surface, you've got the advantage that you've got an entire planet's worth of material, so find ways to optimize that versus adding mass to your vehicle. You do wanna provide enough habitable volume. A lot of people get caught up in the trade of is it modular or is it monolithic? Either one can work, they both have their pluses, they both have their minuses, but regardless of what you choose, you've gotta make sure you get the right size of your total system. And for that, you wanna really rely on the, identifying the tasks that you want the crew to do. The habitat's more than where they're gonna sleep at night. What are they gonna do during their work day? What are they gonna do during the off-duty time? Is there a heavy biology focus? Is there a physical science focus? Is there a heliophysics focus? What are all of those workstations that end up driving the volume more than you might realize? With Space Station, whether this was by design or not, I'm not sure, because Station was before my time, the volume inside the station is driven more by the science functionality than by any crew habitation needs. So that may or may not be the case for a Mars outpost. You wanna think about your translation paths. How does the crew maneuver inside the vehicle? Can two crew pass each other? Are they disrupting other tasks? What have you left in terms of emergency routes? Does the design lend itself to the crew understanding where they are or is there a potential to get disoriented? You need to accommodate where your windows and hatches are. Every place you put a window or every place you put a hatch, that's the station, that's a space that's taken away from some sort of internal utilization. Now you need those hatches and windows, so you've got to intelligently func consider what's adjacent to where and what have you displaced when you place a window or a hatch inside your hab. You need to figure out what you're doing with all your trash, your human waste, your scientific waste, your packing waste. Where does that go? How do you contain it? How do you control it? You need to consider all of those. You're on the surface for up to 500 days. You obviously are not gonna have 500 days of waste inside that hab with you. So how do you process? How do you get rid of it? How does that affect your layout? What, you, what, is, what is your waste passing through when it goes from the point of generation to the point of disposition? You do wanna consider your crew size and your mission duration. A lot of the old texts tried to express volume as a function of crew size and duration. And you see I put a big X on the old NASA standard 3000 chart. We studied that just after I'd come on board and we realized that the science behind it was kind of extrapolated from short duration missions. So we felt that we really shouldn't be using that to try to determine how long you need, how large a module you need. When also when we curve fitted against existing spacecraft, what we flown didn't really match the predictions in the curve. So we really wanna focus on tasks and not on trying to do a 
curve fit because that's more extrapolation than scientific data. And for those who ha had the opportunity to attend the analogs presentation in the last session, you got to hear Natalie and some of the others talk about how they learn from experience in analogs what's working and what's not working. That's a really effective way to drive out what your volume should be. Before you design the interior, you want to know what the crew is going to, what they're going to do. If you just take a hab and say we're going to fit people to it, you've, you've already impacted your productivity. But you want to start with identifying what functions do they really need to survive and thrive on the, on the Mars, and then design effectively. And you see some generally designed co constraints, don't tr have volumes that conflict with one another. Things are going to happen in an order, you want to make that logical so the crew's not going back and forth. You want to use caution when you're sharing volumes. You're going to share volumes. You're just not going to be able to afford to launch something large enough to not share. But you need to be intelligent when you decide what occupies the same volume. And that's another example where testing can come into play. One of the examples we use during Desert Rats is we combine life sciences and medical. And that worked great while the crew was performing scientific procedures. But then we threw a medical contingency in the middle of a science experiment and the crew realized that they were taking time away from patient treatment to get all of the science gear out of the way. And then they thought that might not be the way they want to go if they have a choice. You want to look at serviceability too, so that you can get to equipment that needs to be maintained. And when you're thinking about short duration missions, they may not be short. You might look at a surface rover and say, it's only a three day excursion, this is a short duration vehicle, or it's only 30 days or whatever. But they're on, the, on Mars for 500 days. So if that three days is on day 300, they're already at the mental exhaustion of a long duration mission. And my directorate, we're trying to organize the, all of the issues that affect the crew health and well-being into what we're calling the crew health and performance system. And I'm not gonna go through this eye chart, but it's basically a way of identifying what concerns do we have that stretch across the entire architecture? What concerns do we have that fall into a specific area like medicine or exercise? And then what do we have that is sort of also cross-cutting, but affects our requirements generation. Contingencies, I talked about emergencies. They're gonna happen. They may not happen on mission one, but if you keep going to Mars long enough, they're gonna happen eventually. So we need to think about a new way of how we deal with contingencies. Shuttle was simple. They, they stacked redundancy on the vehicle. If things got bad enough, they just deorbited, and they're on the ground in 45 minutes. Stations similar, they have a whole bunch of spares up there. Something breaks, they just swap it out for the replacement and they'll schedule a, a, another unit on the next logistics flight. Once we go to Mars, we're not gonna have that kind of recurring logistics. The crew won't be able to leave and go away. They're gonna have to deal with fixing whatever went wrong. And I kind of think of the habitat as the buck stops here. Anything in that Mars surface infrastructure that breaks, whether it's in the hab, whether it's on the rover, the lander, the ISRU equipment, Anything that fails, that HAB's that place where it's gonna go looking for help. So you need to consider a maintenance capability. And we don't know right now what that is. Everyone's talking 3D printing and that's very popular. We know that that'll exist in some form. Is that enough? We don't know. Can you take a whole machine shop and condense it into something small enough to fit inside a HAB? We don't know. We don't know what we need yet or how to deal with it, but we do know it's a big issue. Medical is also an issue and that can happen anywhere, anytime. One of the things I worry about is on the rover excursions, we're talking about going 100 kilometers away from the outpost. What if something happens out there? How do we get back to the medical? We know we're gonna have a strong medical capability in the outpost, but how do we get back to the outpost in time if something happens and we're away? And these are just some of the things we're starting to think. We're trying to explore them. We're using analogs to help us flesh them out. But they're answers that we're, we're trying to figure out. We're counting on our partners to help us figure out. And some of you may be involved in some of these studies as well. Let me pass it on to Natalie now. Thank you, Robert. Go ahead, Natalie. Okay, so um, just to begin with, I wanted to start talking about our um, SUDEP website. So you can go on this website, and we have a lot of public-facing information that has to do with um, our 50th EVA, 50th year of EVAs. Um, there's a great video on that, um, and that shows some of what we're doing to develop our next generation spacesuit or our exploration um, extravehicular mobility unit, the XEMU. Um, and so we also on there have a lot of references. We have our um, EVA technology workshop each year. We have a lot of updates, year-by-year -year updates on how that 
um, design is going and uh, where we are in the next step of creating that suit for exploration, extravehicular activity. So check it out. Um, so this is a con conceptual picture of the ex Exploration EVA Mobility Unit, or our XEMU. A lot of these components, most of these components, if not all, are already being um, developed, designed, tested. Um, and we're looking at going ahead, we're in the process of systems engineering um, to go ahead and create a, an XEMU demo to be tested um, with a lot of components that um, we are upgrading or, well, more than upgrading, building um, technologies for this next generation um, and then partially using some um, EMU lower torso um, to have a demonstration on ISS. Um, so that is already in work and we're really excited about it and um, we're, we can't wait for um, the XEMU to be on um, Gateway Lunar Surface and Mars Surface. Um, and so I'm just gonna step through a couple of these things. Um, we, we have the high-speed data comm at the top. Um, we're upgrading to a one-hour emergency return as opposed to a 30-minute, which is the current EMU, um, in order to enable those surface operations and have that um, hour-long capability of your secondary oxygen. Um, we're talking like nominal eight-hour EVA right now. Um, we're changing to a variable pressure suit um, between 4.3 and 8.2 PSI, so you can actually do uh, or perform decompression sickness inside the suit if necessary. Um, and that would also enable us to um, look ahead into the future for possible upgrades if certain ingress, egress concepts come into play. Um, and on that SUDEP website, there's also a bunch of ingress, egress concepts that we've looked at that are alternate to a traditional airlock like you see on ISS. Um, some of those concepts have been in the conceptual operations that we talk about on the Mars surface and lunar surface. Um, we're also upgrading to, or not upgrading, but um, including a lot more in our informatics display and control um, for lunar surface and Mars surface. As, as you get farther and farther away from your rover, you want to make sure that you are um, able to have the consumables to come back to your rover. Um, so there's going to be a lot of different informatics for, uh, for that, as well as like navigation, um, things that we've worked through all of the analogs looking at, uh, heavily working with the scientists in order to make sure that we have exactly what they need um, as far as time stamping and audio and things like that. Um, we're also going to a rapid cycle amine approach, um, which currently on ISS you've got uh, what they use as a medox, and it's a cartridge that they, they take out and then put into a large oven, so that's very massive. It takes a lot of power, um, but the rapid, rapid cycle amine um, removes the CO2 from the suit and is, um, is not a, a consumables limit any longer. Um, we're looking at, instead of having the, the nominal Snoopy cap um, for, integrated, for communications, we have the integrated comm, which is actually integrated into the helmet itself, and it's a lot more comfortable, the crew prefer. Um, we also have enhanced upper mobility, so um, the, the side bearings have been moved inward to where you've got a lot, and the, this also goes back to that awesome video on the suit up, if you can go look at that for the 50th anniversary. It's got a lot more shoulder range. Um, there's been in the past um, shoulder injuries and things like that. We think that that will help with, as well as the suit, the suit sizing itself. Um, it'll allow smaller females to, to be able to fit in and have the mobility. Um, and then we're also looking at um, uh, the membrane uh, evaporation cooling unit, which um, helps with our thermal, and that is um, also uh, um, basically separating um, the, the water and ventilation line. So one of the problems you may have heard of on ISS, that is gonna make that obsolete. Um, 
We're looking at an automated suit checkout. Right now, it, it takes a long time to check out your suit. Um, so we're trying to um, look forward to lunar surface and Mars surface where we can decrease that crew time activity and increase your returns on um, actually going out and doing science or maintenance operations. Um, and then we're looking at a modular um, ORU portable life support system design, um, kind of like a breadboard design where you can actually change out components a lot more easily. Um, instead of currently right now on, on ISS, we have to send the, the EMU back and forth for most things in order to um, change out those uh, on-orbit replaceable units. So we'll be able to do more of that on the surface. Um, and let's see, we've got the rear entry ingress egress design. Um, instead of um, ingressing the suit through the waist and pushing your arms up through, um, you've this will help reduce um, shoulder injury as well as um, make it easier and less time for the, the ingress egress. Um, and then, of course, planetary mobility. So taking uh, lessons learned from Apollo, um, we are adding in bearings to where you can more easily walk, possibly uh, kneel and uh, with both knees, uh, be able to get down and pick up your hammer and, and do um, operations that the scientists and geologists really want to do to enable um, easier collection of that and sampling. Um, and not get as, as dusty on the suit, um, as much dust on the suit. Um, let's see. So for Mars, um, this is uh, um, basically would probably be another upgrade um, because of the uh, environment differences. Um, the, the gravity is different. We're, that would drive us to a lower mass on the suit, whereas on the lunar surface, um, more mass that might actually help you. Um, the planetary protection aspect has been um, an ongoing discussion. There's both forward and reverse uh, contamination mitigation processes, some of which we've listed in one of the documents that we have online on the suit up, uh, a lot of which we are going to be including in our concept of operations. Um, so this drives the need for that dust mitigation um, and we think that's a, a really um, an end-to-end -end layered defense plan, um, starting from egress of whatever element that you've landed in to ingressing back into a habitat or an ascent module. Um, so we've talked a lot of different options on that. You also want to minimize um, the backward contamination on humans and your samples, your geologic samples. You don't want to just go out and um, pick up a sample and um, your, your suit does on, on purpose uh, vent and leak um, slightly. So you, you, do, you don't want to go out and pick up a sample and then realize that you, you found life when it's actually maybe a biome from your, um, your own person. So, um, and then of course there's a CO2 atmosphere. A lot of things that we've designed so far are um, to be used in vacuum. Um, so there's some things that we need to look at with that, as well as the convective thermal environment. Um, and um, so basically, yeah, the, the XEMU uh, for Mars will enable human exploration of Mars by protecting the crew members from the extreme Mars surface environment, um, provide the portable life support system to support them, um, and enable all of the autonomous surface exploration, research, construction, servicing, repair, um, and dexterity mobility to be able to perform that science. And then I think that's it for me. All right. Natalie, uh, go ahead, Pat. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, NASA's Kilopower project, which is a, sm a small nuclear fission reactor, uh, can be used for uh, planetary surface like Mars or the Moon, uh, but also for deep, uh, deep space power. Uh, so a uh, potential look at what the future might look like. So what you see there on the surface of Mars would be four reactors. In this case, they're buried just up uh, past the top of the reactor core and uh, what sticks up, it sort of looks like an umbrella. 
uh, would be the waste heat uh, radiated out to space. Uh, but we actually can put this reactor in several configurations. Uh, so what you see right there is a 10 kilowatt version of kilopower. Kilopower comes in a one to 10 kilowatt versions. Uh, one kilowatt is about the average use of power on your house. Uh, three kilowatts might be the peak use at your home. And 10 kilowatts is enough to, to power several, several houses. Uh, we can uh, fully shield these small reactors. And it looks like the very first set of missions we might uh, do, uh, we might put five of these reactors on a single lander, uh, not do the umbrella type uh, radiator panels, but maybe use some radiator panels built into the lander. And actually, for very early on, just leave the, the nuclear power plants on the, on, the, on the lander. People usually want to know just how big of a small reactor are we talking about. Uh, so the reactor core, the uranium, is about the size of an oatmeal box. If you included, say, the neutron uh, reflector and the shielding, uh, that gets you up to about the size of a trash can. And just above that would be Stirling engines, which take the heat from the reactor and make electricity. And that, with the radiator panel, is all about 11 feet tall, about the height of, say, your uh, little bit uh, larger size step ladder. So not very big all in all. Uh, you're going to need power anywhere you go in space, but on Mars it's going to be particularly necessary. Uh, you're going to need to make propellant uh, to get back to Mars orbit. So as an example, you might have a Mars ascent vehicle. Uh, you want that fully fueled before astronauts arrive. Uh, so we have to make uh, propellant, both liquid oxygen and methane. We'll use the nuclear reactors to do that uh, so that the uh, ascent vehicle is fully, is fully uh, fueled up. Uh, once astronauts start to arrive, uh, they're going to need electricity. That's to make oxygen. They have to purify water. Uh, they want to have power for their habitat. Uh, and they want to power their rover. And it looks like at this stage they need about 15 kilowatts. So we may leave a couple of reactors on the landers. And we may take the other reactors and move them around the site uh, so that we've got little charging stations for our rover. What do we really like about this reactor design is, first of all, it's really very simple. It's, it's almost solid state. Uh, it's just one solid metal core, and, and we have right now existing infrastructure. It's pretty easy for us to go build. Uh, it's simple. It's got heat pipes to move heat, which uh, means it has no really any moving parts for that aspect portion of the reactor. And then we use existing thermal electrics and Stirling engines that NASA has been developing for many decades as our, as our power conversion. Uh, in addition, because of the low power, we can do low cost uh, testing. And as mentioned earlier, we just finished up some testing at the Nevada test site just here about a year ago. Uh, another nice feature about these reactors are they're self-regulating, meaning that uh, the reactor physics actually controls the reactor power. So if, uh, for instance, our Stirling engines want more power, they will just uh, draw more power and the reactor temperature will change and that changes how many neutrons leak out and the power can go up or down. And so there's really, uh, there are control systems on the Stirling engines, uh, but there isn't a uh, control system needed for the reactor itself. Just a quick uh, uh, talk about reactor safety. Uh, understand that these reactors have a very small amount of reactivity in them, about two and a half curies, which is naturally occurring. Uh, that's thousands of times lower than what we currently uh, put into space. Uh, so really, the consequences from these reactors is very minor. Uh, the reactor really doesn't become very radioactive until it's been turned on or fission. Uh, and we won't fission this reactor, turn it on, until we're either on a planet or are very far out into deep space. So recently, uh, we actually took this reactor, we built it, we took it to the Nevada test site, and we tested it in flight-like conditions, meaning we were in a vacuum, we went to full power and temperature, and that was so that we could test this reactor system dynamics. Uh, just to kind of look, these are NASA and Los Alamos engineers uh, building this reactor and putting it inside of a vacuum chamber. Um, we ran this test in March, uh, 1918, or uh, yeah, 1918. Get to get the date right. Uh, from a from a performance perspective, it met all our expectations. It 
it did everything we asked it to do and more. So we were very happy. Uh, now it, uh, we've got a working, working model. So we're looking to what to do next. And so NASA has been looking for a technology demonstration mission. Right now, uh, that looks to be a reactor on the moon uh, to power an ISRU unit to make propellant. Uh, so uh, what you see there is a version of kilopower adapted for a lunar lander. And uh, right now there's still development work on the system and that's gonna continue uh, for the next few months until they decide exactly what we're gonna do. Uh, but we're really happy. Our, our test, which we named Krusty, uh, was the first uh, test of a space reactor in about 50 years since the 1960s. We did that for a very cost-effective amount of money, and we did that in three years. And for NASA, that means now we have the ability to move forward to a flight mission, and we have a design that can provide kilowatts of electricity uh, for several years to decades. All right, thanks, Pat. Uh, so I spoke earlier about the overall SpaceX uh, vision for enabling low-cost transport uh, to both the Moon and Mars. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the surface side of things. Now that said, um, you know, I think the, the context you know, for this is that SpaceX very much is a transportation uh, company. So you know, oftentimes when you know, asked what it is that we're working on in order to enable Mars, you know, th this, this is the focus, having a, a large, fully reusable launch vehicle that will allow, allow us to really drive down the cost of access to space and then uh, transporting cargo and people to Mars. The capabilities that this brings, I think, that can really help out on the surface is the fact that we can deliver uh, quite substantial payloads, so over 100 tons uh, per flight and the capability to deliver multiple uh, flights per mission opportunity. That, that will help us basically leverage uh, significant uh, imported mass that we can use to help simplify uh, systems early on and then, then down the line allow us to scale up uh, to have significantly more uh, people on Mars. Um, you know, in terms of enabling the, this transportation and particularly the return, uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, important aspects associated with producing the propellant for this vehicle. Uh, it's also something keenly of interest. Uh, so that will be basically access to wa water ice uh, from the surface to provide um, one of the inputs to the propellant production along with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is one where we're able to take advantage of the fact that you know, Mars has you know, a fairly significant resource base and, and, and that atmosphere that you know, has the advantage of coming uh, right to you. Um, and then combined with a lot of power, uh, we, we can use that to, to generate propellant that we use to fill up the ship in order to enable the return back to Earth. In terms of how we would envision initial missions uh, to, to Mars occurring, we would start off by sending a, a series of cargo flights, basically pre-emplacing um, some of the infrastructure that you'll, you'll want to have there, along with uh, just generally proving out that all the resources that you're um, going to be counting on are, in fact, in place, and, and make sure you, you fully understand um, you know, the distribution of, of those resources and any hazards that, that could be present there. Uh, by, by having this uh, large cargo capability that also allows us to you know, basically pre-emplace significant infrastructure that subsequent missions can take advantage of. Uh, generally speaking, we plan to probably send at least uh, two cargo flights in that first opportunity, then following uh, having confirmed uh, that the appropriate resources are in place, uh, follow up with additional uh, both cargo flights and crew flights uh, in, the, in subsequent opportunities. So, uh, notionally sending at least two more cargo uh, ships along with at least two more uh, flights with people on board where those in initial uh, crew would be working to really set up the, the overall infrastructure for the base, uh, proving out the capabilities that you would need in order to, to grow um, you know, beyond uh, just an initial um, sort of expeditionary site into to something that can uh, you know, gr grow in, into a more significant presence there. So as you, as you, you know, envision this and, and you know, in terms of some of the things Robert was talking about, about where it is you'd want to go and what you, what you might see, uh, one of the big questions in the context of going and building up a city uh, is basically, you know, wh where is their, their water? Uh, th so this is one that 
we at SpaceX have been engaging with a, a number of people within NASA and, and elsewhere in the planetary science community to help drive in on, on some of these sites that uh, could be quite useful for initial uh, human uh, habitation on Mars. So access to water is, is very much a, a highly important one. Uh, that, that's, there's definitely plenty of water ice up at the poles. However, on the other side, you'd really prefer to be closer to the equator from both a power and thermal management perspective and just general operability, uh, not having to deal with you know, polar nights and so on. Uh, so on, on Mars, that would generally take you to probably somewhere in the 30 to 40 degree uh, latitude band. And then combined with the elevations on Mars, that, that uh, will tend to drive you in, into the northern hemisphere. That said, there are a number of uh, sites that we have identified that uh, hold really good potential here and working through just you know, what the best site would be amongst those along with uh, ensuring that we're in a location that we, we can land safely uh, while also having um, various resources that we'll want mo moving forward. Uh, in terms of those resources itself, for, for ice, uh, there's sort of two, two main uh, sort of different categories of ice that I think are of most relevance early on. One would be ice sort of in the plains of Mars uh, that could be fairly layered. And then there are also um, some debris covered glaciers, which may be a longer term resource in the sense that there's uh, significantly more ice in those, but that it may, may be something that will take a bit more effort to um, gain access to and, and, and make use of. So I think that overall a combination of approaches will make sense there uh, between techniques that can be used to excavate ice sort of from the plains along with things that could go into these uh, buried glaciers and, and gain access to that. Uh, while, while ice is the, the pr primary resource early on, we'll also want to make sure that we're accounting for other potential resources and how that can uh, help enable the buildup of a, uh, an outpost and city and, and so on. Um, as we get into that infrastructure, I think that early on, some of the things that will be of, of primary benefit are things like landing pads. There was actually some discussion earlier in terms of the context of the moon of, of the benefits of, of you know, having, having a nice solid surface, not only to help you in, in the landing itself, but help protect assets around you, um, you know, avoiding uh, sending a lot of debris out, out that can um, cause, cause hazards to, to other uh, systems. Um, and then, uh, additionally, I would see early on the, the use of local resources for things like radiation shielding, uh, you know, help, helping cut down on the, the overall galactic cosmic ray dose that will be experienced, um, and then uh, you know, eventually building out habitats and, and other structures as well. Uh, now, as, as we would grow, we would see you know, beyond things like landing pads and, and fairly straightforward habitation, I think a lot more capabilities that you'd want to bring, bring online. You know, fairly fundamental to being able to you know, be a robust uh, uh, civilization, basically, is that you would need to be able to um, you know, keep, keep uh, going even if, say, ships couldn't make it in one opportunity or whatnot. So a critical aspect of that will be food production, um, so you know, agriculture and, and whatnot. Um, certainly power is what's gonna, gonna drive all, all of this as well. So, uh, th these are the sorts of things that I think will be very complementary to the overall uh, SpaceX vision of providing low-cost, uh, affordable transport to Mars and, and things where th th there's really a lot of opportunities uh, across the board for people to, to get involved in there. Um, you know, a whole variety of organizations, I think, can, can support these, these efforts on the surface where some of the benefits that you might have for being fully integrated on the transportation side, uh, you, you don't necessarily need, need all of that on the surface side. I think there's a lot more opportunities for a variety of different approaches uh, being employed in parallel there. Um, and we think, talked about it earlier as well, but also, also looking at the overlap uh, with missions to the moon, where things are similar, where they're different, and where you can test out uh, some of these capabilities will be uh, quite, quite useful too. Um, so with that said, though, I think we'll uh, maximize time for questions here. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll uh, start asking for questions from uh, the audience, but I, I think I'm going to kick it off here with a question for uh, each one of the panel members. Um, we just heard that uh, NASA's made a, well, the, the uh, Space Council has made a commitment uh, for NASA to be back on the moon by 2024, and then to have a, uh, a 
permanent or uh, at least a sustainable uh, base on the moon by 2028. So given that uh, there's going to be a lot of focus and resources put into uh, attaining that kind of a goal, where do each one of you think uh, that's going to be, that's going to help advance these kind of systems that we need for Mars? Where is there, uh, the, where is there some parallel development or at least uh, development that helps you advance towards what you need for Mars? And where are the, those places where the, the lunar uh, effort may be in one direction, whereas the uh, Mars kind of a development might go in a different direction? So let's start with Paul, and we'll work our way back this way. OK, yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, so when you look at the surface of, of Mars and you look at the surface of the moon, uh, there are a lot of things that are, are actually quite different between them. Mars has. Uh, you know, significantly more resources available to, to you, and uh, you, you have an atmosphere and, and whatnot. Um, that said, on the, the other hand, one of the challenges with Mars is that, you know, it's, you know, only, there are only mission opportunities every 26 months or so. Uh, the, the transit to, to Mars is, you know, on, more on the order of six months as opposed to, you know, three days uh, in the case of the moon. So one of the big advantages I think that the moon has is the ability to much more rapidly iterate and, um, you know, go there and try things out. So even if, say, the overall resources are different, I think just getting um, teams engaged in those things and, and, and working on the, the rapid iteration cycles will be uh, quite, quite helpful for the moon. And, you know, the, the other thing is, um, on the transportation side, at least, we're developing our system such that we can go to both uh, destinations using that same hardware. So we'll we'll get a lot of opportunities there uh, to prove that out too. And you know, as we go through things, I think that what we will learn on the moon will certainly be helpful for Mars. And then it's not something where we need to go stop you know stop going to the moon in order to go to Mars or anything like that. I would certainly see benefits in having uh, you know human presence in both in both locations. Um, you know, research stations on the moon and cities growing on Mars. Matt, how about in the area of power? So uh, for power, I mean, at least for nuclear power, I think they're going to be uh, the same, if almost identical. Uh, I'm sure that won't be the same for solar because of, of uh, differences in distance and, you know, dust storms and the fact that you have lunar night and a few other things. But for at least for nuclear, for us, it's going to be a good chance to, to test out a system. Uh, probably at lower power, learn to interface with things like in situ resource utilization as people look, you know, to make propellant water. Uh, uh, then for us, actually work out how our, our conduct evolved, how we'll do startup, how we'll do shutdown and, and removal. So a, a good place, the moon will be a good place for us to learn so that we can then move on to Mars. Natalie, how about EVA? Yeah, I'm uh, really excited. I think we're um, a lot of the way for 2024 with our current suit design. And so that's really exciting. Um, and then uh, 2024 and beyond, um, I think we're just going to learn so much about dust mitigation and, um, and the operations that take place that will help inform um, how we operate on the Martian service. And then um, really help us with that planetary protection aspect um, since a, a lot of the dust is brought in by the suit. So um, I, I think that's going to really help with that. And, and in the meantime, as we're operating on the moon, I think that tech dev towards coming up with the right technology for um, the different atmosphere of Mars, like CO2 removal and thermal environments, will be underway um, in preparation for that 2033. Robert, how about habitation? Well, like Paul spoke of, I'm a huge advocate of commonality. I hope that we will go to the moon to stay and go to Mars to stay, and that we'll have people, astronauts on the moon, interacting with astronauts on Mars. So for that, my hope is that we'll have common habitation systems, that we won't develop one habitat that's the moon habitat and then spin up a totally different program for the Mars Hab. I think we'll learn a lot on the moon, especially at these early missions, about how does low gravity affect your posture? Skylab taught us a lot about the neutral body posture that we were then able to apply to station and to shuttle program to some extent. We don't know what we're interpolating between zero gravity and 1.6G and 3HG to find out what it should look like for the moon and Mars. But I hope we'll design habitats that are adaptable so that we can study that on the moon 
and use those lessons to optimize to have internal configuration for Mars, maybe even play back and forth between the two and better understand the effect of low gravity on human physiology. But I think we should definitely try to take advantage of the moon to prove out the surface habitats for, that we're gonna to take to Mars. So let me, I see we have at least one question here. Let me do one quick follow-up on habitation. Is there any technical reason why uh, habitation on the moon couldn't be common with habitation on Mars? I am searching for that. Um, my, one of the things I'm studying on my own right now is just to see how common they can be. There's an assumption that they aren't, but I wanna to try to prove that out. I know that you've got thermal issues that are different. One of the things Natalie alluded to is the, zero, the lack of atmosphere on the moon enables some heat rejection techniques that you can't necessarily use on Mars, but that's gonna affect the external heat rejection. I wanna see how common can the internal systems be. And that's still a work in progress, so give me a couple years and I'll be able to answer the question a little better. Like a true PhD. <laughs> um, so we have a question over here. Let's start with that, please. Um, hi, uh, my name is Brene Hadnot. I'm a grad student from Johns Hopkins. Um, so in the last session that I was in on in, uh, ISRU, they talked about the possibility of Martian dust particles being very abrasive, kind of like the ones on the moon where it cuts like glass. So what are ways that you can protect these habitats or spacesuits or rockets or nuclear reactors that you put on the surface of Mars from cutting dust? Let me... Uh... Pat, you said that there was gonna be a lot of commonality between the moon and Mars. So let me start with you. Is there, can you see any, any take your specialty uh, nuclear reactors? Is, there going to be, is the dust gonna be a problem between the two planets? Or? So possibly the only place that I'm worried about dust is on if we have radiator panels, but uh, the reactor and its internals, and again, there really are no moving parts, is, in, is sealed, it's a sealed unit. So I don't really expect dust to, uh, to impact much of the internals. Uh, because we haven't designed some other heat rejection systems for Mars where we might do something other than radiator panels, I would assume if we did something mechanical, because you do have an atmosphere, dust would be an issue. Uh, but for us, it's uh, right now, at least on the moon, I, I don't see it uh, being a huge impact, at least initially. Natalie, on suits, uh, there's a lot of flexibility, and we've all seen pictures of the Apollo astronauts getting dirty when they fell down and, and, and had to get up out of the, the lunar regolith. So do you, what kind of problems do you see with dust on, on both planets, on the moon and Mars? Yeah, we, we are currently working on environments um, to meet those requirements. Um, and so those are including abrasion and dust resistant and um, cut resistant. And so, uh, so far, um, looking at the moon, we're thinking that could be the worst case scenario since there is the weathering on Mars. And we'll also probably want to stay away from some of those um, deep drills um, for planetary protection purposes. But all of that, you know, is still in the, in the concept of operations right now. Um, uh, the lunar uh, aspect is, is being worked into the requirements and the concept of operations right now. So um, I feel pretty confident that, that we'll be able to encompass um, Mars with our lunar requirements. But that's, again, there are people smarter than me working on that environment aspect. <laughs> Paul, do you have any, anything you want to add? Oh, I think you know, along the lines of what Natalie was saying. So I'm not, not a dust expert by any means, but my understanding is that the dust on Mars is generally uh, less abrasive than, than uh, what's on the moon because, you know, as Natalie was saying, the dust on Mars basically is moved around by the wind and, and that helps to, you know, round, round off the edges. Uh, I think there are also, you know, a number of techniques that have been developed to help, help protect against that dust, seals that can, can work with them um, and so on. And, and when you look at sort of the excavation equipment and other things you'd want to be using to gain access uh, to resources there, you, you definitely would want to be including um, you know, as many of those techniques as you can, and then, um, you know, having good redundancy and spares and maintenance capability uh, to, to, you know, fix things uh, on an ongoing basis as well. When I say, I, I, I want to ask Robert, um, dust getting inside, we know dust will get inside. I mean, I don't think there's any way around that. And we saw that on, on the Apollo missions. 
uh, and we're anticipating it for any of these either lunar or Mars missions. So how do you, how do you see dust affecting um, how, how habitats are either laid out or how you manage the dust that will inevitably get inside? I think it's an understated problem. And I think one of the biggest culprits is gonna be the mobility assets. And a lot of times you don't think about that when you don't think about the integrated system, but we've got these rovers, especially the large pressurized rovers, crew's gonna be driving around. Those mobility systems are gonna get inundated with dust. And at some point we're gonna to have to take those apart, bring pieces inside the hab to the maintenance work area and, and work on them. So how do we keep that from contaminating the rest of the living volume? And how do we clean the maintenance area? We're definitely gonna to have to involve things like bagging. So we'll have to use layered protection where we try to clean it as much as we can before we bring it in, but that's never gonna be good enough. We're gonna to have to encapsulate them somehow in some container, some container where we can clean the exterior, put the dirty thing inside the container, bring it into our hab, then we need some containment inside our maintenance area. We're still gonna have dust escaping there. So we're gonna to need to design every part of the hab for cleaning. We wanna, that's gonna create conflicts with other issues. We're gonna want smooth surfaces from a dust mitigation perspective, but from a habitability, from acoustics perspectives, we don't necessarily want those smooth surfaces. So it's gonna be a design trade. We're gonna to have to understand compromises and maybe some components may be removable and replaceable over time or maybe cleanable in some way. But it's definitely a challenge we're going to have to work out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question, please. My name is Ben Pearson. I have a couple of quest quick questions for Patrick. Uh, first of all, what is the fundamental limit with the Stirling reactor? Could you take a 100 kilowatt, a multiple 100 kilowatt with this technology? So, so right now we're, we're, we're limited by two things. Our reactor core, the, the type of fuel we're using, uh, which is solid metal block, uh, in order so that we don't have to do prolonged testing, we're, we're limiting how, how many atoms can fission. So that's a limiting factor. Uh, Stirling engines are another limitation, although they can go to fairly high powers. But I think as we move to 100 kilowatts, we'd probably switch over to something like a gas Brayton system, uh, just because it's, uh, the number of Stirlings might get to be too hard to handle, and it might be a more efficient, more elegant system. And the second related question is, do you have any concept for using the waste heat instead of just expanding it out into space? So, sure, I mean, when you talk to, there are a lot of folks that want to want, you know, because we're, remember, even with the Stirling engine, we're two thirds of our heat is waste heat. Uh, that could be used for some of these chemical processes in ISRU or heat for other applications. Uh, so yeah, it, we haven't thought about it a lot, I will be honest, uh, because we haven't been asked to, but but a little, yeah. Okay, thank you. I thought we had a question over here, I guess not. Okay, two for one. Next <laughs> one, please. Uh, Mike Douglas, I'm curious about, uh, have you heard or have you, uh, about the using magnetic satellites to mitigate the solar wind for like, uh, for and radiation effects on on the Mars and the Moon. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot at that one. Uh, the, I, I'm familiar <coughs> with the concept. I think for these early missions, the, the kind of infrastructure we're gonna be able to afford uh, and be able to deploy is, it will not be that extensive. Uh, somewhere down the lines, that there may be uh, a way to uh, invest in that kind of infrastructure, but I don't, personally see that happening for quite some time until we're better, uh, we have a better understanding of how people are gonna live and work on the surface of both of these planets. Okay, and um, just the other thing was, uh, how are you planning on dealing with perchlorates in the soil? Uh, that's another one. We, um, the, the perchlorates in the soil is an issue because it's, uh, it's a potential um, hazard for human health hazard. Uh, perchlorates uh, at one time were considered medicinal, uh, I've come to understand. So it's, uh, I guess there's, a, there's some debate about how serious that problem is. Uh, if we get into things like crop growth, for example, which is a, a longer term, well, a longer term uh, area that we wanna get into, but it's also something that we'll, we'll be interested in experimenting with 
with these early crews, uh, there'll have to be some kind of remediation with the soils that we use for things like crop growth. So uh, there are techniques to, to get perchlorates out of the soil, uh, remediation techniques, and we're looking at those. Uh, the dust, as the dust comes in, as Robert explained, we're gonna have to be careful about how we uh, filter the air, how we clean the surfaces, uh, to make sure that that dust, uh, whatever perchlorates are in that dust, uh, do not get to be uh, uh, at a level that would be hazardous to the crew. But we've also been speaking with the, the flight surgeons about that, and uh, as a general issue, the, um, the kind of, we think we have the right kind of dust mitigation techniques in general to keep uh, inhaled dust, uh, which even the inert particles can become a problem. Uh, there are ways to, that we, we think we have a good handle on how to mitigate the dust uh, issue across the board, and that would include the perchlorates that might be in that dust. Next one, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, I'm William Kramer from HDR Incorporated. And in the United States and many other industrialized countries, environmental assessment is part of any major construction project as a way of identifying adverse environmental impacts and hopefully reducing them or, or mitigating for them. Are you aware of whether government or commercial interests that are talking about developing the moon and Mars have considered environmental impact? I'll open that up to you guys first and I'll take a shot if you don't have anything. I've only heard anecdotal considerations. I, I think it's, somewhat understood that it's necessary, but I haven't heard that formally work its way into any, any programmatic planning. So, so I can answer just a little on the nuclear side. For any nuclear launch, you have to do an environmental impact statement. Right. Now we'll be honest and say that it's really re related just to the launch of the vehicle, not so much when you're on the moon or Mars. Uh, I don't know if that will change, but, but right now you do at least have to look at uh, impacts to the Earth itself. Uh, from the right. launching of, of nuclear material. Yeah, I know the uh, Mars 2020 EIS, you know, is, is a massive document. It is. Uh, but it doesn't mention anything beyond LEO. So it's, uh, okay. And then one fun, very short question is, uh, with the windows on habitats you were talking about, has consideration been given to just mounting a camera on the outside <laughs> of the hull and then a screen on the inside? Thanks. That is the first thing a structural engineer says when a human factors engineer asks for a window. The general, and there may be a generational shift coming, but what I see most of the times when this issue comes up, the crew wants a real window that is a real direct line of sight view to the external environment. And it's, it's not even about what the view is. And this is both microgravity and, and surface. So even in cases where the, it's obvious you can't see the earth, they still want the window. And to them, there's still a universe out there, they wanna see it, whether, whether the universe is giving them a view of stars or of the moon or of the earth, they wanna be able to look directly on it. There is concern about if a power fail or camera fail cuts out that view, they don't want to have that in their wrist chain. They wanna be able to know that if, they're, if they look at the window, they can see the outside environment. Now, some point in the future, we might become so used to the electronic world that all we care about is just digital imagery. <laughs> that may happen, it hasn't happened yet. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, very quickly, could each of you uh, give your best bet as to when uh, all of this could be ready? <laughs> Habitat, suits, energy, vehicle, <laughs> um, and for the, the best bet for the first humans on Mars? So, Natalie, I heard you answered this one before, so I'll let you go first. Yeah, yeah, I think um, with our current design of the suit um, and where we're going, I think that, that uh, we can meet the 2024 with the, the right funding, the right um, personnel. <clears throat> I think we're probably farthest along for surface ops, in my opinion, <laughs> um, than um, most surface ops. Uh, uh, I meant Mars. So. And Mars, like I was kind of saying earlier, I think with that parallel um, sustainability on, on the lunar surface and uh, with that additional tech dev to get us to where we need to be for 
um, the Martian environment, I think that's also possible from this super perspective, in my opinion. So. Yeah, you were. You also mentioned the development time you thought had to go into it. So why don't, can you? Yeah, a little. I I don't really know because there's so many other things that have to happen to get to Mars. I I think for us, you know, uh, our, we think we could have our technology ready fairly soon. So if we started using it on the moon, I think it could then go uh, directly to Mars after that, if if the other infrastructure is available. Paul, oh, you've been looking at uh, at architectures in general for the surface. Have you uh, you have any sense for when that level of, of uh, infrastructure could be ready to go? Sure. So, so in our overall uh, planning in order to enable you know transport to Mars, uh, we're basically looking at the mid 2020s. Uh, to be able to support the types of missions that I, I was laying out there. So, um, you know, Starship and, and Super Heavy uh, sh should be, you know, getting to orbit in the relatively near future. Uh, we're definitely, you know, quite interested in doing what we can to support the overall vision of having people, you know, back on the moon by 2024. And I definitely see that as being uh, quite achievable. And for, for Mars, um, what we are trying to do is, is decrease the, the total number of technologies that you need would need to develop and allow um, somewhat more brute force approaches to some of these things to help um, speed that up. So I would say it's it's not out of the question by any means to have you know people on Mars uh, you know in the mid 2020s. Um, there's definitely a lot of uh, systems that will be needed to make that that all happen. Um, you know, well represented I think across the the panel here today. Robert, how about habitation? Okay. Let me answer it this way. A lot of people want us to have an Apollo moment and have a president stand up like Kennedy and say, we've got to do it, and the entire country come together. If that happened, I would actually say 2027, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think in our current approach, we are going to be lucky to do it by the 2037 date. It could easily, easily slip beyond that. If I were to be a pessimist and say that we're gonna do it on our traditional budget is cut every year, we're going to rethink if we wanna do this program, it could be the 2060s. It's really more a matter of willpower than it is a matter of technology or readiness. I think we're ready to do it now. We could, we could go today, but it's a function of how important is it to the well-being of the United States. So I, and I think that's what we forget. We love space and so we wanna thank Whatever's out there to be done, it's gotta be done because we're passionate about space. But NASA is a agency of the federal government. Its, ex its existence is to advance the interests of the United States. So you've gotta balance space against all of the other considerations that the country has. And that's what they're doing in Congress when they set how much, what our budget level is and whether they cut us or whether they redirect us. It's not about if they want us to go to Mars, it's about how do they balance that against everything else. So it depends on how space plays out as a priority against everything else that the country has to deal with. We could get accelerated or we could get slowed. I want to go back to one of the, the uh, environmental considerations. There's something that um, has been discussed in other places in this the last couple of days, but it, it applies here. And I think it, it applies in the sense that, that the question was asked in, and that's planetary protection. Right now, uh, there's a, a worldwide agreement about how we will, uh, we will not contaminate other planets and we will not let other planets contaminate Earth. So there's a lot of consideration that's going into how we, how we design systems and how we conduct operations uh, that we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about for Mars. Every, every robotic vehicle that's gone there so far, at least from the US, has uh, complied with those planetary protection, the forward contamination requirements. Uh, when we send people there, um, we, there's a general acceptance of the fact that once people go, the, the biological things that accompany people, uh, anything from dead skin cells to active bacteria, are gonna get out of the habitation, out of the habitats, out of the suits. Uh, so we have to be, conscious of, of how we, uh, where we put people, how we allow people to move around on the surface, so that if there are, are areas that we're even suspicious uh, may have some evidence of life, uh, in, including active life, uh, um, extant life, that we don't allow uh, 
people to go in there and confound the situation uh, of, of the scientific research that would, that would come from that. Um, <clears throat> and we also don't want to discover life that we brought with us and have that false positive come back. Coming the other direction, uh, you've seen some pictures of, of landers with tunnels going from rovers to uh, ascent vehicles and those sorts of things. Uh, that's not just a convenience. Uh, we're trying to also break the chain of contamination from the Mars surface uh, coming back to Earth. So we have another, another consideration of how do we get crew who have been living in this environment for some number of months uh, into an ascent vehicle and bring them back to Earth and, and convince ourselves that we're not bringing any Martian uh, life forms back with us should they exist. So uh, in that respect, the, the, the environmental impact kinds of, uh, th that's one way of, of that, that is one facet of this, the, the larger question of environmental impacts that we have to take into account. And it's, a very, it's gonna be a very important one. It's gonna drive a lot, of the, a lot of the systems, a lot of the operations that we have to take into account so we can comply with uh, this agreement that the United States and many other countries uh, on the earth are, are signatories to. So I see we have another question here. Hi, uh, Britt Adkins. I'm a grad student at Colorado School of Mines. Um, my question is, I guess, a little bit forward looking, but um, once a transportation network is established and Martian infrastructure becomes more mature, um, I'm just curious as to what you all think in terms of whether a continuous human presence will be necessary uh, for maintenance and operations or whether there will be a greater reliability on uh, autonomous design. And then sort of as the second part to that, if, uh, if you believe that a continuous human presence will be necessary, how does that inform habitat design? Thank you. So let me Let's start with Paul at the architecture level. Sure. So, yeah, I think in terms of why why we're you know, doing what we're we're doing, it, it's really to enable uh, you know people to to go and, and live on Mars. So, from that standpoint, you know, I don't think it's a, a question of you know do you want to have people there because that that is the um, basically the the entire purpose of, of it when we're looking at setting up cities and, and whatnot. I do think though that there will be a lot of automation that, that will help out. There will be basically a very severe labor shortage on Mars for you know <laughs> quite, quite, quite a long time. So uh, you'll, you'll want to be make, making use of that to help, help um, out and basically leverage as much as possible all of the time that the, the people there have to um, you know, work on the, the most critical things that are going to best leverage uh, their skill sets. So, you know, there may be some, you know, r remote sites or whatever that you, get, you know, a crew only visits, you know, on occasion. But at the same time, you know, there would, in, you know, the model that that we're looking at, uh, be a, a, you know, sustained presence uh, with people there basically permanently once you've uh, first got them there, and then increasing the total number of people there with time. Robert, you addressed uh, this in, in some respect when we talked about the dust question. So mm -hmm. what, what other aspects of, of habitation go into or would be affected by a, a permanent presence, particularly one that's there to, well, more of a, mm -hmm. an Earth-like uh, economy? You're really taking every aspect of life on Earth and compacting it into your spacecraft. So you need to think about things like your medical capability. Right now, there's a limited set of medical conditions that we consider. But if you're going to have humans permanently on, on Mars, and you could, you could take that different way, differently. You could have an overlapping presence where a crew is there just for 500 days and then another, another crew is there to replace them. Or you could have a crew that's actually moved to Mars and they're going to live the rest of their natural life there. So depending on which one you mean, that's a potentially a huge increase in capabilities. In particular, I meant overlapping presence okay. in my question. But yeah, that's a, that's a great point as well. So for overlapping crews, you're thinking things about, you don't really have a medical evacuation. So in a severe condition, you have to not only provide the additional treatment, initial treatment rather, but also the recovery and potentially rehabilitation. So that's taking us to a level that we haven't looked at yet in medical workstation design. For vehicle maintenance, you've got to not only go from the initial, again, the initial recovery, whether it's a spare, 
but to fabrication. So we need to start getting to the point where our ISRU actually is building new components or even building replacement vehicles. You'll start to see changes in the living quarters. Um, that's been your kingdom for 500 days and you leave and the next person comes. When you leave, you need to make sure you didn't leave your mark on it because that other person needs to be able to come in and make it their place. So some of the durability or replacement or re refurbishment of, of, of the habitat comes into play, not just in the crew quarters, but throughout the vehicle. And as Paul said, it gets to why are you going? There is, there is a community that wants to go to Mars because they want to live on Mars. The fact that they're gonna do science is an excuse. There is another community that only wants humans there because they need the humans to do the science. So it, it kind of depends on which framework you're thinking about in terms of do you make that transition to continuous occupancy and at what scale. Great, thank you very much. Okay, do we have any other questions? I don't see anybody at the microphone at the moment. Do any of the panelists have any other, any other comments that they want to make, anything that they thought of uh, in, during the course of the questions that, uh, that they want to expand on? No? I do want to reiterate the importance of analog testing. And something I haven't seen yet but would love to see is an end-to-end -end mission test where the crew begins in an Orion simulation, goes through a simulated transit to Gateway, then a Gateway simulation, then a simulated transit to the Mars transit vehicle, simulate the Mars transit, then to the lander, simulate that landing, then to the outpost, simulate that 500 day surface day or 300 day, whatever it is, and then take the entire trip back. I think there are hidden things in the interaction of diff different vehicles that we haven't seen yet. And I, I would love to see that happen before we actually commit to a Mars infrastructure. Can the moon play a role in that? It absolutely could. I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about doing a deep space transit shakedown cruise in cislunar space, but you could expand on that and not only do the shakedown cruise, but actually go down to the lunar surface and do a shakedown Mars, Mars mission on the lunar surface before returning to the transport. Okay. I see we have another question. Go ahead, sir. I was just wondering, uh, which do you prefer or which do you think is going to happen subsurface living on Mars or <laughs> above surf, or below or, you got one in it. <laughs> yeah. Take that one, Robert. Obviously above surface is simpler and that's what you see in most of the artist concepts. Subsurface gives the advantage of radiation protection. So I think, I think radiation is gonna be what drives it. I don't know yet whether that answer, radiation is gonna force an answer or not. I know from a crew habitability perspective, if the biology allows it, you would prefer to be on the surface because then you could have window views of the Martian exterior. Now, we've toyed with hybrid concepts where you have the bulk of the habitation buried, but there is sort of a cupola that extends above the surface so you can come up there for different periods. That's kind of a, a notional best of both worlds. And then there's the idea of the lava tubes or caves where you don't have to dig your trench, but you simply transport your habitat inside an existing <clears throat> underground facility. So I don't know which will play out, and I'm not really an advocate of either yet. I just think that the research data on medical is, on, on radiation is gonna be what forces us towards one or the other. Okay, I see another question. Go ahead, please. Um, Edmund Mashi uh, from EMA Corporation. Uh, my question is for SpaceX, uh, Paul. Um, while SpaceX is launching uh, internet from the space, uh, is SpaceX uh, uh, is going to also have a data center uh, on the surface, uh, in the moon, or in the mass? So, uh, is the question about our activity, our plan for activities on the surface, or? Uh, launch it, uh, yes, uh, launch, while you, uh, uh, SpaceX is uh, trying to launch inter internet from the space. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, you're, I think, oh, so if you're asking about the Starlink, so yeah, we have a, a launch uh, coming up this evening, I haven't checked the, the latest status on that, uh, but um, yeah, definitely very excited about the potential for that, that's gonna be a test of um, some of the capabilities that 
will help enable, hopefully, in the future, um, you know, broad, broadband from space. It's not an area that I'm uh, particularly an expert on, though. So. But, uh, uh, you guys are also planning to get the data center on the uh, surface, uh, on the Mars or Moon, something? Is the question about communications on, on surface? Yes, uh, the data center communication. Yeah, so I think that that, that will be certainly an area that uh, we'll want to have attention going forward. You know, right now, you know, at Mars, there's a Mars Relay Network, which is basically made up of the existing scientific uh, orbiters ha have a relay capability to help um, take data from, from the surface, get it back to Earth. That's something, though, that I would imagine you'd want to expand uh, quite significantly uh, in order to have um, you know, people there. Uh, that said, from a total mass perspective, the, you know, um, you know, so some number of communication satellites to help enable that probably wouldn't be um, so significant in the overall plan, but definitely a, a key feature there, um, both to enable uh, basically better coverage, you know, rather than only having, you know, high data rate capabilities a few times a day, having continuous um, coverage, and then also on the, on the data rate side, uh, you know, DSN, the Deep Space Network, is what's used uh, at Earth right now to get data back, um, which, you know, has been great for all, all the different things it's doing, but uh, longer term, I think you'd want to have um, additional capabilities to really support, um, you know, growing presence on, on Mars, uh, beyond what DSN can, can do right now. Uh, my last question is, how secure the uh, network going to be? So, uh, yeah, that's an area that I, it's not, not really my area of expertise. So unfortunately, I can't, can't comment on that. Um, I have a question to all the panel. Um, I haven't heard anybody talking about that yet, but um, do you believe that uh, life uh, on other planets um, and other civilizations is possible, uh, and what needs to be done in order for those space travelers to be prepared to meet those other civilizations. <laughs> we need to consider that possibility, right? <laughs> sure, I'll take a shot. I was talking to someone a couple days ago, and I said I think both possibilities are staggering. There is one possibility that, just as you said, there's intelligent life out there, other civilizations. The other possibility, there is no intelligent life out there, it's just us. To me, both of those are mind-blowing. And we'll never know which one it is unless we actually meet an intelligent civilization. So what happens if we meet? I don't know what happens. I mean, for, for us... I've heard of any preparation for that, so we are, we are not prepared, <laughs> apparently. My joking answer is watch lots of science fiction. I mean, it's also a serious answer. I mean, sci-fi allows us to think about things that do not exist today or are not possible today. So it's a great way to exercise your mind and think about what if, what if the what ifs, what if that which is not is. So sure, think about it. I mean, I don't see NASA having a lot of emergency contingency procedures on if we meet the aliens, but I could be surprised one day. Anybody else wanna? I know we have a planetary protection officer somewhere running around here. <laughs> <laughs> I would defer to her. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, speaking you know, from my own perspective there, I think that if, you know, talking about other civilizations and all that, you know, in the next uh, 50 or 100 years or, or what have you, they're as likely, you know, to be found, you know, coming to Earth as finding them on Mars or elsewhere. So I don't think it's something that's going to be unique for, for you know, you know, this relatively small fraction of uh, humanity going out there and more just, you know, as Robert was but saying, something you, that would be amazing that... to think, think, think through, you know, what those possibilities were, but uh, it's definitely not something I'm personally working on on a regular basis. Just speaking of risk scenarios, there should be an agency that is also preparing for that part, right? <laughs> just we don't have anybody <laughs> representing that branch. Eventually we could be the uh, uh, aliens that... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next Thank conference, we really want to hear more conversations about potential <laughs> <laughs> meetings with other civilizations. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, um, my name is Ari Cho from XBio, and uh, this is probably a question more for Paul, because I think um, uh, SpaceX's goal probably is more of a colonization of, of Mars and the idea of being able to, you know, for a cataclysmic event, prevent 
the extinction of human existence, correct? And so uh, what, what barriers are there to us getting to the point where uh, a colony on Mars is actually self-sustainable, where if Earth were to actually disappear, and we don't have you know, the ability to go back and get more data or get more medicine or whatever it is, um, you know, what's the, the time horizon to be able to have a, um, a situation where we actually have achieved that goal where um, human life would not be extinguished if Earth were to have a cataclysmic event? So, yeah, there was you know, a, lot, a lot of things you know, in that overall question. You know, as we talk about you know, going, going to Mars, setting up cities there, I think there would definitely be a, a strong incentive for the people there to, to you know, increase their overall level of uh, you know, self-sufficiency. Um, you know, I think it will probably be quite a long time before you know, if um, you know, the ship stopped coming from Earth that you'd be um, you know, just perfectly fine, not, not an issue, but you know, the same is true even you know, within you know, economies on Earth, we're very you know, interdependent um, across the globe. But I do think that uh, you know, early on it will be um, you know, make sure you just have you know, power and, and habitation and whatnot that will you know, allow you to stay for an extended period of time. And then food production is likely going to be one of the things that you'll want to uh, bring online. Uh, when you, you know, get down to the level of, say, like, you know, microprocessor and, and, you know, electronics and so on, my guess is it will be quite a long time before that's actually worth, you know, make, making on, on the surface, but something where you could stockpile, uh, you know, reserves in advance or, or, or whatnot to help out there. Um, on, on topics such as, you know, medicines, that might be one where um, it may pay off, you know, when you look at it from a, you know, you know, self-sustaining standpoint to have capabilities that wouldn't necessarily just pay off from a pure mass trade to um, you know, be able to do, do some more things locally than uh, you would otherwise. Um, there may also be benefits there just on, um, from a time frame perspective of uh, you know, get, getting things to Mars and the, the, uh, the transit times and launch availabilities too. How about the, the human factors of it as far as like um, planning for births and generations on Mars? Um, a person born on Mars, which never has been exposed to Earth's gravity, to obviously behave differently on Mars. So, so I'd like to get to the point where um, you know, we wouldn't die out because of lack of, of um, ability for the gene pool to sustain. Like those aspects also. Yeah, I think you know, not definitely not my area of expertise. I think <laughs> there's else. some really fun fun science fiction, uh, you know, talking about some some of those questions. Um, there there has also been been some research there, but uh, overall, I think it will be it'll be really good to have a you know good solid uh, transportation capability on an ongoing basis to uh, keep refreshing everything there on Mars. That even gets in the area of ethics of research to even try to understand what a a, an infant would go through being raised in a non-terrestrial environment. It's something that we haven't taken on yet. When, when humanity is really serious about colonization, somehow they're gonna have to cross that bridge, but right now, there are just so many unknowns. No one could tell you right now if, if a baby could be born off-world and, and be okay or not. Okay, so we have one more, go ahead, please. Um, in an ideal scenario, um, looking forward, what would the composition of the first group of humans um, on a longer term basis on Mars um, be and why for each of the panelists? Let, let me ask first to ask, what do you mean by long term? How I mean, long not like the first people to get there for an exploratory mission, um, but the first people who are maybe staying there for a more extended period of time. Well, let me, let me still just poke at that because sure. the, the way the trajectories work, we're, we're probably gonna, there's gonna be a group of people that could conceivably be on the ground for as much as 500 days. Right. In the uh, first mission. In the first mission. So is that long-term? I guess, in, in, I guess in, projecting in, out from the first mission, um, or I mean, answer as you will, I guess. Um, for first mission, if that suits you. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyone wanna go with that one? I'll just take a quick shot, like um, just from our analogs discussion um, and working with ISS and um, looking at the CONOPS going forward for both lunar, Mars, everything, it seems like you would want expertise in several different 
um, areas. So you'd want a geologist, you'd want possibly um, you know, a medical officer, um, engineer you know, that, that can fix the vehicles. And um, so kind of a, a, a wide range of folks that can also um, have a really good rapport with each other and get along and be able to play their roles as needed. So that's just my opinion. I, that's not, that doesn't have anything to do with spoot, you know, say space boots, but it's just my thoughts um, from what we've seen. Mm -hmm. My ideal, and obviously different architectures will allow different crew sizes, and my ideal is not the NASA reference mission, so don't, don't think this is what NASA's looking at. One of the things that I noticed when we did field testing is we had a four-person crew in the habitat, and we were utilizing the HAB systems pretty much occupying the entire crew. We also had pressurized rovers, and we learned that we needed two, for, for safety purposes, we wanted two rovers, so you had sort of a buddy system and each rover was a two-person vehicle. So that, to me, gives me a minimum of eight. Now, the baseline's four, so we're not doing the ideal. I would say eight is a minimum that I would like if I could be king of the universe for a day, but I wouldn't necessarily stop at eight. I would look to see, could we increase the crew size further? It's a lot of investment to get to Mars, so I would wanna maximize what we can get in terms of a return on investment. Two geologists is better than one, two medical doctors is better than one. If we went today, I, th I think eight is possible, but a lot more expensive than the current record, so I don't know that we would ever get that, but I would set eight as my baseline, maybe 12, maybe 16. I'm a little more conservative than uh, Robert. I've uh, often talked about having at least six people, though. Mm -hmm. uh, a crew of four, if, if someone gets injured, uh, they fall down, they break their arm, they, they have some sort of other uh, injury, then you've not only taken out that person, but you've taken out the caregiver that has to uh, take care of that person. So you're now down from a four-person crew to a two-person crew for uh, getting anything done. And as Robert uh, indicated, there's a lot of, if you look at what Space Station does now, there's a lot of time spent by the crew just maintaining systems. So if you're going to, um, you, you're gonna have some sort of floor for, for crews that are just keeping the, the lights on and the machinery running. And you have to have something above and beyond that to be able to keep the, uh, be productive in the mission. Um, if you think about it in terms of skill sets though too, it, it, that, uh, you know, if you look, there, people seem to have innate capabilities. They're good at some things and not good at other things. I think you can, you can look at all your friends and neighbors and, and realize that. Uh, if you kind of extrapolate that, you could, you could see that, that for a crew like this, you're gonna have to have somebody who's gonna be the commander, the, the person in charge and, and the decider of things. Uh, you're probably gonna have to have a medical person there too, somebody who's good at, at the, the medical arts and sciences. So that's two people. Um, and then the, the way I've been thinking about how the rest of what you're trying to accomplish there in a general sense, you probably have two people that are working in the sciences, one in the physical sciences like geology, one in the um, biological sciences because we're gonna to wanna to understand what happens for humans, the human beings uh, and potential other uh, related things, whether it's bring plants and animals along or not. Uh, somebody who, uh, a person who understands the physical science and someone who understands the biological sciences or specializes in those. And then to keep the systems running, you're probably gonna to wanna to have somebody who understands computer systems. How many have ever had their computer go bad and, and wanna know why? Uh, and then the physical systems, keeping the pumps and the, and the uh, um, other mechanical devices running. So when you add that up, you come up with six. And that's kind of, to me, that's kind of a floor. Um, there's been some work done by a fellow named Jack Stuster, um, and he works, his company is called Anacapa Sciences, and if you look up his website, he's uh, done, published some recent work on this very question. He's gone through one of these Mars missions end to end and looked at the skills and the activities that the crew would go through, and he's racked and stacked uh, what kind of person, what kind of skills, and how many of each do I, does he think he needs. Uh, it was a study done for NASA, and it's, uh, I believe he's posted the requirements. He just recently finished that one. 
there's been some other, uh, another popular place to look for comparisons for analogs, if you will, is, are the, the polar regions, whether it's the, the Arctic or the Antarctic. Uh, and there are a number of studies, including NASA studies, that have been published along those lines, where they look at uh, when you have small groups of people, the, the interpersonal um, activity between groups of people becomes an issue too. If you have too few people, if you have three people, you could get two people ganging up on one. Uh, that's a legitimate concern. So you have to think about how big does a group have to be so that you don't, you have enough inter Rack interpersonal react, uh, activity going on is you don't have little cliques forming and, and, and uh, somebody ganging up on somebody else. Those sort of things have to be taken into account as well. So um, there's a lot of considerations that are going into that. There's a lot of considerations into which specific individuals you're gonna pick to be able to do that. Uh, and so it's not gonna be a, a simple process to try and figure out who goes and how many go because there's also going to be this tension between, you know, four people obviously takes less food, space, whatever, to than a six-person crew or an eight-person crew or a dozen-person crew. So there's, that tension is going to go on until we kind of, everybody agrees that we've kind of reached the, the right balance. Thank you. I'm looking at uh, the clock here. It got reset on me. So I, do we have time for more questions or are we ready to move on to uh, other things? More questions? Okay, um, go ahead, sir. Um, this is space spacesuit question. I've heard I've been trying to follow some of the more advanced technologies that are coming out around spacesuits, and one that I found very interesting was uh, doesn't have actually a uh, pressure suit underneath. It actually just the spacesuit just compresses your body uh, to a level of like to 14.7 pounds per square inch to keep so your blood. There is, there is research going on about that in the universities, uh, David Newman and folks like that. So, um, and that is uh, something that is extremely cool and way much less mass and definitely better looking, depending. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so right at this point, um, uh, it's, it's still at, at that, uh, that level. Uh, that technology level for us, so we haven't incorporated that into our technology dev. So okay. That's so what do you think about the time uh, timeline when that might be ready? I have no idea. Like oh. I, I wouldn't be. I'm sorry. I wouldn't be able to answer that. No. But I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Everybody wants a Matt Damon suit or <laughs> Sandra Bullock. <laughs> so I have another question for Paul primarily. At what point in time, what milestone does Starship have to achieve to you personally feeling confident that it's going to be able to hit a particular launch window to Mars? I don't know, I think, I think that's, that's one where, uh, you know, the approach that we, we take overall is to, you know, build and test and build and test and, and so on. I, I don't know if, you know, one particular you know, thing, but uh, you know, I'm sure that as soon as we're ready to go, we'll be sending at least a, you know, one or two ships on, on test flights out there. Okay, I don't, I don't see anybody else, and we're, the clock is getting pretty close to the end here. So, um, unless some of the, the folks in the controlling this thing wave me down, I think we're going to call it a day here. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.